All right, so we're back in the book of 1 John. We're in chapter 3, verses 10 to 24, and it's, are you in love? It's a, it's a question I ask, are you in love? And you know if you're in love or if you're not in love. You'll, you'll know the difference. Uh, if you've ever been in love, you know how it can be so incredibly magical and how it just takes you over, and you do and say things that you wouldn't otherwise do because it doesn't make any sense. Uh, I've seen young men who fall in love who do the most ridiculous things. I've seen young women do ridiculous things that they wouldn't otherwise do or swore that they never would for the love of a man. So the question is, are you in love? Do you have that overpowering sense that you've given yourself over to one person, to this person that, that God has selected for you? And it's interesting, and you may not think it has anything to apply to our passage, but it really does, because the greatest love that we could ever have is something that mirrors and looks like God's love. And so when we understand his love for us, it helps us to mirror his love to others. So as we look at that, I'd like you to just consider the question, are you in love? In 1 John chapter 3, verses 10 to 24, it says, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest, Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. For we know that we have passed from death to life, because we love the brethren, and he who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, that we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commands and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as he gave us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. It's a very complex sentence, and he does not write in the same way that the Apostle Paul does. He continues to circle around these same things, and he looks at them from different aspects. And so as we look at love and what it truly means to love someone and to love the brethren, and he gives some examples of what love is not so that we don't get confused, and he brings up a couple of examples, which is good. I, I appreciate examples. So moving on to chapter 3, verse 10, And in this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God nor is he who does not love his brother. So there are two characteristics of those who know God and have a relationship with him. Number one, they practice what is right. They do that which is known and understood universally as what is right. We understand that from God's word from beginning to end. And second of all, that they practice loving your brother. It's not something that you do once. It is not something that comes on an occasion uh, like Christmas or something. It's something that is a part of your life. It's something that you practice. Now, we understand that the children of the devil practice unrighteousness. They practice it to the point where they're experts at it. They're extremely good at it. Uh, if they're liars, they're very good liars. If they're, uh, th if they're thieves, they're very good thieves, and, and it's hard to get them caught. So they practice unrighteousness, and they practice hating their brother. 
they practice repeatedly hating. It's not something that uh, is an occasion. It's something that they get very, very good at. And they learn to do it in the most subtle of fashions, sometimes by just saying something inappropriate about somebody in passing. And it can happen even in the Christian community, which we need to be careful. But it's something that is practiced by those who are the children of the devil. Notice, you are an offspring of one or the other. You're an offspring of God, or you are an offspring of the devil. There is no medium ground. And you kind of have to decide according to the criteria which one you belong to. So, behavior declares your allegiance. Your behavior, what you do, betrays who you belong to. And it always will. If, if you say that you believe something and yet you don't act on it, then you don't really believe it. Your behavior always will test your allegiances. So, we're either overflowing with God's blessings and our hearts and our hands are reaching out to the world, or... We're one of those who persecute those who are like that, and we practice unrighteousness. So you have to figure out, what is, the, what is the descriptive of my life? Is it that I'm practicing loving people? Is it that I practice righteousness? Or am I practicing unrighteousness? And am I practicing not loving someone? Am I holding on to bitterness, resentfulness, anger? And you, you sort that out in your heart, and you start to determine who you're really serving. And there, there isn't really any games, and there's no wiggle room here. So he moves on to verse 11. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. So you see... We have heard this before, so we know this. We've heard this, okay? Uh, growing up, if you've grown, around, uh, grown up in church or if you've grown up in society, you have heard this, that you should love one another. If, if you grow up in a family with other children, your parents will tell you this, even if, even if they don't practice it. You're supposed to love one another, and he's depending upon his audience understanding that the Old Testament is filled with this information. And you can look, you know, from Genesis to Malachi, we are to love one another even though we're not worthy of it sometimes. We're to do that. And he says, you guys know this. You've heard it from the beginning. This isn't, you've heard it and you know it. Because you know what it's like to be loved. You know, when someone shows love towards you, courtesy, kindness, compassion toward you, you know what that feels like. It's, it's probably one of the greatest emotions that can stir us. In fact, I think it's the greatest motivator to do anything is love. Uh, you can be motivated by fear, you can be motivated by money, you can be motivated by all sorts of things, but to be motivated by love is the greatest motive that there is, because there's no real downside to it. And if it's real love, a godly, agape, unconditional love, it'll, it'll ring true and you'll be able to see it. This behavior declares allegiance. So you saw Cain and Abel, two brothers of, of uh, Adam and Eve, and Cain made an offering from the fruit of the ground, from the proceeds of his hands, something he manufactured. And Abel gave a sacrifice of an animal where there was bloodshed. And God accepted one sacrifice, the one of bloodshed, over then the one who had fruits and vegetables and grains. And it's interesting because there are places in the scripture where you worship from both of these. But as a sin sacrifice, there is nothing without the shedding of blood. There is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And so Abel knew this because the only way that Adam and Eve's sins were covered were by God making a sacrifice. He understood this. Abel understood. And Cain just went about and said, well, I'm going to worship God in my way, a picture of doing it his own way. And it just didn't, didn't please God. And so Cain knows this. God, Cain knows that what he's doing, God doesn't accept. And, and the best work of his hands and all of his farm, he gives the best, ripest fruit. And yet, God doesn't want that. He wants a living sacrifice. He wants a blood sacrifice for our sins. And this is something that he's, he's putting very early, all the way in the Old Testament, so that we might understand as we come and we see Jesus, the Lamb of God, who was slain from the foundation of the world, we understand that the blood sacrifice is needed. And we see that Cain was of the evil one. That's why he did what he did. They both weren't good, but you do know that they both reached out to worship, but only one was accepted and one was not. 
So here you have an example of perhaps two people even sitting in a church trying to appeal to God, trying to be an acceptable human being before God, and yet one is going to act out of their nature that is not godly, and one out of a godly nature which is obedient to God. And so your behavior always will belie who your master is. And so it did with Cain and Abel. And so we're given an example of what love is not. Love is not murder, just so that you know, in case you were confused. Murder is probably the highest way of not loving someone. It's annihilating them from the earth and deciding that you have a right to do that. So that's one way that you don't do it. You don't murder your brother. And if you're talking about brotherly love, which this certainly is, and it's talking about those of us who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, loving one another. And certainly we should love our family closer than we love anyone else. And certainly these two, if there were brothers, these were brothers, same mother and father, and yet one mur murdered the other, and there wasn't love. So that's one way that we can do that. And you know, there are all sorts of subtle ways that we can murder someone. We can assassinate their character. Uh, we can murder their reputation. Uh, we can take away accolades. We can do all sorts of things with our words. It doesn't necessarily have to be a physical murder, but certainly physical murder is the epitome of hate and not love. Verse 13, Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. For we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. And he who does not love his brother abides in death. So love is something that is an essence of a Christian. And if you don't have it, then you still are dead in your spirit. And don't fool yourself by saying you walked an aisle or you did something that you, uh, you know, somebody said that you needed to genuflect or something. If you have hate in your heart and you have bitterness in your heart that just you practice, you don't know it. Because if you do, you would be wrestling with that thing and slapping it down and putting it out of your life. So hate is one of those things. Don't be surprised if people hate you. They may not murder you, but they might hate you. That's, that's usually the precursor to murder is hate. So um, life is not a popularity contest. The scripture says that not everybody's going to like you. Don't be surprised if people hate you. Uh, if they hated Jesus and you look like him, talk like him, act like him, and your heart is like his, well then they're going to hate you too. And if they crucified him on a cross, what do you think they'll do to you? So we shouldn't be surprised that that happens. And he says, don't be surprised if they hate you. And evidence of being loved is to be loving. The very evidence that God has shown his love toward you and showered his forgiveness upon you is that you are loving to others. It's, it's the truest sense that you are loved. If you've ever seen somebody who's not loved or not appreciated, they won't let anyone else be loved or appreciated. You notice that? If you find somebody at work that feels underappreciated or, or not uh, noticed uh, for what they've done, they will never let anyone else be appreciated for anything. They will squelch it and sit on it as much as they can because they hate the fact that they themselves are not recognized. But see, when we get the love of God and we understand God's great gift as he came down in person, in the, in the body of his own son and died for us, and he did that to take your place, when that percolates into your soul and you understand it and God opens your eyes to it, how could you not love a fellow sinner when a perfect God went way out of his way to take upon himself our sin so that we might have a relationship with him? So the very evidence that God has shown his love to you is that you show love to someone else or everyone else. In fact, how is it that Christians can be miserable at any point in time ever? Because we are the recipients of God's unconditional love. And the very fact that we show it to someone else is a natural thing that a Christian does. The third thing is, if you don't possess it, you can't give it away. If you find that there's somebody who just can't be loving, if you find that there's someone who just can't say a kind word or a nice thing, and, and you've met these people, and maybe you are one of these people, uh, ask your friend, a good friend, who loves you. They'll tell you the truth. You, you have to wonder, why is that? Well, it might be because you haven't received it. Because if you haven't received love, you certainly won't know how to give it. It's a little bit like trying to be a father and never having had one. Or to be a good father to your child and never had a good example of it. 
uh, thank God there are books and there's education and there are good people who could show you. But if you've never had an example, you couldn't be it. So if you don't have God's love, then what you end up being is just angry. And this sort of hatred is one of those things that will get in your soul and it'll be expressed on your face. And you know it when somebody hates you. That look, that despising look, that you're not good enough, that you don't measure up. And, you know, there are some reasons that we should be angry. But anger is something that you express because of an unrighteous thing that happens. It, hatred is something that is fueled, that's held on to when there's a resentment that goes on in our hearts. That needs to be gone. In fact, the scripture tells us not to let the sun go down on our wrath and not to let the devil have a foothold. So we're not to let the sun go down. In other words, don't, don't let something go overnight. Don't sleep on it. It's not a good thing to sleep on. It's like something in your fridge that's just been there for way too long. You just don't need it. So, hate. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So John speaks to us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about murder. And you might say, well, I'm not a murderer. And then he talks about hate. And you go, well, maybe I got some of that. And he says, hates murder. And you say, well, I don't know, I, I think maybe I've hated some people, but I don't think I've ever killed anyone. Well, what is really the difference? When God looks into your heart, the only difference between hate and murder is the physical act. Because he's already seen your imagination. He's seen what lies in your heart. He's seen the stench of that seething bitterness that's inside of you. And it's the same exact thing, except it lacks the physical act. Now... Anger and murder definitely have a different sentence, I would say. If you murder somebody and you get caught, uh, and they prove it in a court of law, you'll, you'll get put away, or maybe if you're in a state where they have the electric chair or something, you, your life will be taken from you. But if you're bitter, who's going to police that? Well, God does. God polices that. But it also shows something about who we are when we have that. If you have a predisposition to practice that and hold on to those things, if you've got a backpack full of bowling balls, which is uh, your life as you've gone through and you've picked up reason to be bitter at almost anyone, you got to wonder what kind of a person would hold on to that? What kind of a soul needs to have so much ammunition? There are people that are so damaged and so hurt because of the things that they carry. And you have to wonder what kind of a person are you? that would do that and hold on to that? And who wouldn't willingly lay that down? Well, somebody who's a murderer in their heart. Jesus tells us about it in the scriptures, but if you're a hater, you're a murderer. If you're someone who holds on to hate, resentment, maybe you're a gossip monger, maybe you talk about people behind their back, maybe you're resentful, maybe you try to do little digs in conversation, uh, you use sarcasm, you use all sorts of things, and trust me, I understand what that's like. I, I see it in my own life. You have to wonder why. Who hurt you so bad that you have to hurt people that badly or that you can't forgive? Is it that you haven't experienced forgiveness? That's a good question for all of us to ask and answer. And number two, haters do not possess the presence of God within them. If you're a hater and say, well, I'm, you know, I'm a good Christian person or at least I'm, I'm good with God or whatever it is that people say, it's not true. You can't have the presence of God inside of you and hate people. And if you can hate people that you see that are made in God's image, how is it that you can say you love God who you haven't seen and these people are made in his image? And the scripture asks us that question too. So Matthew 5, 21 to 22, Jesus tells us this. You have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. In other words, you'll go to court. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. In judgment, he's talking about eternal judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, that means empty head, shall be in danger of the council. In other words, you'll have to sit and be judged for that. It's, we call it slander uh, or, or, or something else. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Jesus is teaching a principle that murder on the outside begins with hate on the inside. 
And if you have hate in your heart on the inside, you won't stand before a judge and jury, but you'll stand before God and have to give an account for it. And there's only one place for people who hoard that stuff in their heart, and that's a place that's eternal separation from God. It's a place called hell or Gehenna, which is a, a picture of a trash heap that's on fire. And it's something we earn, something we deserve, because we don't come before God to get rebuilt, remade, refinished, and forgiven. And when we do, we're new people. And God makes his home in us, and we don't have this in our heart anymore. So the murder that you see on the outside always is preceded by hatred on the inside. And as far as God's concerned, there is no difference. So you know what murder looks like. You know what hatred looks like before murder steps up. There was a recent story about two men uh, this past week who came behind a jogger, a black jogger that was in their neighborhood, and they suspected him of scoping out houses, of robbing, and they killed him. The men jumped out, pulled a gun on him, and killed him. They tracked him down, and they have it on video. You can look it on, on the Internet. The only difference between the hatred inside them before they did the act and the act itself is that they're going to stand before a, a jury of their peers for the act. And for their heart, they're going to have to stand before God. Don't allow things in your heart to fester, and especially if you are a recipient of God's grace. We should never, ever hold on to things. We have absolutely no right to do that. Because if God were to hold on to the stuff that we've done, we would not be recipients of grace or forgiveness. So, moving on to verse 16. And by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. But whoever has this world's goods, and he sees his brother in need, and he shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us love in, not in word or tongue, but in deed and truth. You see, he's not talking about physical murder anymore like Cain and Abel. He's not talking about hatred in his heart, which is what's the precursor of murder. He's talking about apathy. He's saying, how can you say that you have love for somebody and avoid them? Or how can you say that they have a need and you have the ability to solve their problem and you walk on by and ignore it. Or you avoid them, or you screen your car and go, oh, I don't talk to that guy. That might be a little close to home for some of you, but this is avoidance, and that's not love either. It's not love to avoid people, and to be the very one that might have the answer to their problem and not answer their problem. Number one, I think this is saying that we have seen real love demonstrated, and certainly it does. We saw it demonstrated in what Jesus did on the cross. You want to see what real love is? Watch a perfect God step down into perfect man and give his life willingly, having done nothing wrong, hung on a cross, tortured, and die for those who hate him. That's perfect love. And because we see that, and because he's our, our Savior and he's our Lord, we want to be like him. And so he remakes us in his image, and we should be laying our lives down for one another. Just quite simply, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that's a daily routine. That's what we do. Uh, number two, we should be dying to self for others. Since Jesus did it, we follow in his footsteps. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like a thousand different things. And there are certain people that are gifted with the ability to give because they usually have the ability to make. And because they have more than others, we have an obligation to share with those who have need. We're always looking to give those things away. And you know what it's like to give to somebody that has a need when you can fulfill that. What a blessing it is, whether it be a word of encouragement or whether it be finances or food or whether it be shelter or somebody that needs a, a place or counsel, whatever it is that God has enabled you to do, what a wonderful thing it is for you to give it away and to be like God and help them and be a savior because Jesus ultimately is the one who saves our soul. We can't save souls as human beings, but we can be like Jesus and we should certainly be striving to. Number three, when you propose this, when you possess the solution, how can you be apathetic? It's as though you're eating a meal, just a sumptuous meal, in front of someone who's starving, and you just ignore them. 
How can you do that? How can somebody with a living, breathing heart of, of, from God do that to another human being? And yet, our society does it all the time. And if you're not careful, you'll get trained on how to do this. Now, I understand there are times that you should help people, and there's times you shouldn't help people, because God is doing a work in their life, and sometimes by helping them, you're hurting them, especially if somebody's a drug addict or somebody is just a habitual user of, of human beings. There is a time when you say no, because to be loving towards someone is to say, I'm not going to help you, because you got yourself into this, and you're going to have to figure out how to get out. But I don't think I should take the food out of my kids' mouths and give it to you, because this is all you do is you've made it your life's goal to be a, a, a person who's constantly feeding on the lives of other people. That's certainly not scriptural. But for us to become so circumspect about how we help and who we help can become something a bit more difficult and more philosophical than it is a heart reaction to God prompting us to do that which he would do. So we have to weigh these things out and none of them is simple of course but we have an example as Jesus Christ did for us we should do for one another. And number four we need to put up or shut up and you are what you do. I think the scripture is saying, you're defined by what you do, and if you're ignoring people with needs, how can a living heart of Christ be in you? And obviously, you know, we're trained uh, to ignore things like that. If you've ever been to New York City for any length of time, there's people everywhere that have needs, and it's one of those things where if, if, you, if you walk up to them, you can become very, very involved. Um, maybe overly involved in, in helping them and, if, and I've done this and I've made mistakes. But then there are times when I have tried to ignore things and God has broken my heart about it. We can't do that and say that we love God if we're unwilling to do those things that he prompts us to do in our heart and yet we're unwilling to give because we don't want to sacrifice our stuff or our time or our energy or being hurt. And, and that's also a fear that a lot of people have. So. How can the love of God be within you if you say, hey, listen, I hope everything's good with you and you know, I hope you're well fed and warm and everything, and you know they're not, and you have the ability to help them and you don't. How can the love of God dwell in you? It, it can't is the, is the answer. So apathy is definitely not love. So we have murder, which is definitely not love. We have hatred, which is just like murder, which is not love. We have apathy. Apathy is not love either. So there's really no room for any of these tactics. Uh, it's just, I don't care. And if you're not careful, if, if you put your heart in the wrong direction, it, you can get your heart hurt. And if you go to help other people who are in need, you will be hurt, just know that. But so is Jesus. And how'd that work out for him? Pretty well. So, verse 19, and by this we know that we are of the truth. By what? It's by our love and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. He's talking about preventing a heart attack. Um, a, a heart attack meaning your emotions or your, your heart uh, betraying you. There's uh, three things I think that he's saying here in, in plain language. Love assures our heart before God. If you're showing love towards other people, and you go and you pray before God, you know that you and him are all right because you're doing what he wants you to do. And I can go before the Lord when I know that I'm doing the things he wants me to do, and I know that uh, he smiles on me, and I know that when I talk to him, he hears me, and I hear him, and I know things are well. And it assures me that I have a relationship with him. I'll never doubt my salvation when I'm loving other people because... I know I'm doing that which God has filled me up and equipped me to do. It's when I don't show love towards people, I start to wonder, how can I know the Lord Jesus Christ and be apathetic or angry or murderous? That's when I don't have confidence before God. Uh, like Adam and Eve, I need to find some leaves and cover up because I'm disclosed. So, love assures our heart before God. One thing. Number two, Love overcomes our condemnation. It says that when our hearts condemn us, if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart, for he knows all things. So 
I don't know about you, but does your heart condemn you? Uh, do you ever feel bad? I'll, I'll put it in a common vernacular. Does your heart ever tell you that you're a schmuck? Does your past point fingers at you and say you're not good enough? How can you say that you're a Christian? I mean, look what you've done. How can you... I, I get it all the time. I get the fingers and the whispers on my shoulder. The devil tells me I'm not good enough. And How can you speak to people about these things when in your heart you still are working this out? Or, or the things that you've done. I've done horrible things to hurt people and uh, purposely, angrily destroy people before coming to Jesus. And what do you do with all of the combined junk that you have done to hurt other people? That's condemnation. And the scripture says that the antidote to the pointing fingers at you and what a worthless, horrible, not good enough person you are is to show love towards other people. I also think it happens to be the antidote to depression is to love other people. Because depression is one of the most selfish things that you can get into. It's looking at you. It's looking at all the negative of you. It's, it's under condemnation. So how do you reassure your heart when you go before God you love other people? And even when your heart condemns you, you can go before God and have your heart not condemn you because he took away all the shame. He took away all the guilt. He took it upon himself on the cross. And the devil can tell you all day long that you're a dirty, lousy so-and-so. The fact of the matter is, Jesus died to take all that guilt and shame away from you so that you could live like him. What a blessing that is. So, when your heart condemns you, you can come before the Lord Jesus Christ because God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. By the way, he knows every sin you commit. You'll never surprise him. He never goes, oh! I can't believe you did that. He never does that. Sometimes I do that. Somebody will cut me off and something will fly out of my face and I'll go, where did that come from? I didn't even know I knew that word anymore. God, forgive me, I'm, I'm a bonehead. And he goes, yeah, I know. And I knew you would do that. And I, that's why I died on the cross. And it's okay, I love you. So let's, uh, let's work on that. <laughs> and so we work on that. And it's, it's very helpful. So. Number one, love assures our heart before God. We can go before him with assurance that he hears us, we hear him, we're in relationship. Number two, love overcomes our condemnation when your own heart, when your own heart tells you you're worthless, when you think you're worthless, God will tell you what's true, even above what you feel. And number three, he frees our heart to confidence. We can go before God and we can pray and know that he hears us and we have confidence before him. What a, what a blessing that is. And if you know what it is to harbor something in your life, to hold on to some besetting sin, something that is something that you've fallen over and over and over again, if you know what that's like and how, what a misery it is to bear that in your heart and, and to feel just the pressing weight of your own sin, how do you get out of that? Well, you confess it. You confess it before God and you just keep walking and you do those things that he wants you to do and you repent. You apologize. If somebody has been hurt by your actions, you go to them. You go to them and apologize for what you've done. You ask for forgiveness. Please, can you forgive me for what I did? I understand the full extent of what I've done and how I've hurt you. Can you forgive me? And you ask them to drop the rock. You ask them to take that condemnation and drop it to the ground. And then you tell them, listen, I'm not going to do that again. I repent. I'm, I, I'm so sorry it happened. I, it's not going to happen again. That is a process that we have to work through, and we'll be working through all of our lives, unfortunately. I wish it were easier than that. I wish we could just, you know, take magic fairy dust and be perfect, but that won't happen until we leave this body. Uh, thank God it won't be forever. So, God's unfailing love comes upon us. Romans 8, verses 1 and 2 says, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but the Spirit. And the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin is that it captivates the one who does it. The law of death is that sin leads to death, but I'm not going to die. Physically, my body will go away but I'm going to have an eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ. The power of sin and death and the condemnation that once was upon me is gone. And Jesus took it away. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, he's taken it away for you. So we should walk that way. So, 
Verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. It's a very interesting passage. It says that when we go before God, whatever we ask, we receive from him. So one of the byproducts of us loving others and loving the brethren and being in that loving relationship with God is when we pray and we ask God for things, he answers our prayer. So the opposite is true also. If we don't do those things that the Lord would have us do, and if we're not in a loving relationship and abiding in him, when you pray, your, your prayers are just going to bounce off the ceiling. Have you ever felt that way? Like I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. Well, could it be that there's something in your life that the Lord wants you to get out of your life and you're living in rebellion? It very well could be. I know that I've had it in my life. I'm praying because I want God to do something and uh, I'm a little disappointed he doesn't do it the way I want or when I want. And then uh, he says, why is this such an important thing to you and why isn't it so important that you do what I've asked you to do? That's a really tough question, but sometimes he asks those tough questions, always in love, and I'm so grateful for it. But one of the benefits, one of the effects of living in a loving relationship with God and loving other people is our prayers are answered, and who wouldn't want their prayers answered? We become affected and trusted servants of God. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. It almost sounds like because we are obedient that he answers our prayer. It sounds that way, doesn't it? It sounds like, well, if we're good little boys and girls, you know, you better be good for good's sake because, you know, he knows when you're sleeping when you're awake. And, like, he's only going to answer your prayers if you live perfectly. Well, here's the thing. If we're not living according to his rules, and if we're not doing what he tells us to do, and we're not being favorable with his leading, why would he answer our prayers? That's a little hypocritical, isn't it? But if we're loving on him and we're loving other people, for him to answer our prayers is a very natural thing. And when you have a right relationship with a child and a child with a father, the father wants to do anything he can to please the child, and the child wants to do anything he can to please the father. That's a natural thing. But God will answer our prayers because we can be trusted. If you're praying, wow, Lord, I really wish we could help so-and-so financially and you don't have the well, you're not well off, you don't have the means to do it. You pray, Lord, I pray that you might increase the boundaries of uh, my paycheck so that I might do that. You know the Lord will do that if your heart's in the right place? He's done it for me before and he's done it for me many times. When I haven't been able to, I've asked the Lord for things and he answers prayers today still but not while I have something going on in my heart between me and him. Because for him to do that would be hypocritical and it wouldn't be very loving. The whole reason he has a relationship with us is so that he can show himself and love on us and make us into his image. And if we're resisting that, then the father and son relationship, the love is not there and we are the ones who stepped out of it, not him. So he finds us to be trusted servants of God and he can put things into your hand and he can answer prayers for you and you're not going to get cocky and think you can just do whatever you want to do your way and God's going to do whatever you tell him. That's a bunch of hooey, no matter what they say on the, on the TV. So, and number two, the true love begins with Jesus. Notice, we do what's pleasing in his sight and this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. That is the commandment that we as a people are to do. Above all other commandments, it's the one thing. And it's the only question that God's going to ask when you get to heaven. What did you do with my son? What did you do with Jesus? And the answer, the true answer, from your heart, is what is going to make all the difference in eternity. Either you accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for your sin, and you've accepted his life in yours, or you have it. It's just that simple. Because there'll be sinners in heaven. There'll be sinners in hell. The only difference is Jesus and forgiveness. So, true love begins with him. It says in 1 Peter 3, 7, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, meaning wives. So this is a word to you husbands. Dwell with them in an, with understanding, or in an understanding fashion, 
giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. Ladies, don't be offended. It just means that you're a wine glass and a man is more like a giant beer stein. Uh, you don't go clinking glasses real hard when you have that kind of life. As the weaker vessel and as being heirs together with the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. The scripture says that a man's prayers are hindered when his relationship with his wife is not right. That's right, men. That's right, ladies. Don't think God's all accepting of him if you just had a big argument and he's holding on to some bitterness. Don't think that he's all that in a bag of chips in God's eye, that God sees it. And unless that's removed, God is prevented from moving in the way that he thinks he wants to move. So we see that us not being in a right relationship with God prevents God from doing the things he would otherwise do. So let's cooperate, for goodness sake. And in John 6, 28-29, Jesus teaches us this. And they said to him, What shall we do that we may do the works of God? Well, that's a question that many people ask. What do I have to do to be acceptable before God or to do what God wants me to do? You know, just boil it down for me, Jesus. And he says this. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. That is the work that a human being will be saved by or condemned because they haven't done, is whether we've accepted Jesus Christ. So those of you that know and love him, you know that this is true. Verse 24, last verse. Now that he, now he who comes, he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he and him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. So another one of the effects is that when we obey his commandments and we love others as we're supposed to, he abides in us and we in him. We have that love relationship. It's like when you're in love. You have a loving relationship for God. You just want to do anything he wants you to do. And he has a loving relationship with you and he wants to do anything he possibly can. And it's the most beautiful thing that a human being can ever experience is this right relationship with God, which was purchased with the very blood of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing it is. And for us to love others and to be an outlet, God will continually fill the person who's always emptying themselves for other people. But if you're wondering why you, you feel so empty, are you letting God fill you so you can empty into the lives of other people? Are you that kind of a person. We're not built to be reservoirs. We're not built, made to be containers. We're meant to be instruments. We're meant to be conduits of God's love to other people. And whatever it is that might be blocking you up, it's also blocking up your relationship with God. So figure that out and do some business with God and let him clean you out so you can be a vessel of this love to other people. And love is the greatest assurance that we belong to him. When you can show love towards other people that don't show love back to you, and they, they say mean, horrible, terrible things to you, and you feel sorry for them, and you show them love in, in, in kind, that's the greatest assurance that you know him. If you can't do that, maybe it's a condemnation that maybe you don't. So, 1 John 2.24, as we read previously, says this, Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and the Father. Us being right with God, being in His presence, being in a right, loving relationship with Him, has everything to do with whether we're holding on to and being obedient to loving our brother. And there's a lot riding on it. And I'm not sure that we study and I'm not sure that we pray about God. How can I show love to the people around me? It doesn't matter who it is, uh, someone that you meet as a stranger or certainly somebody that you're related to either in Christ or in your family. Showing love to them shows much more about the person that you are than it does anything else. And so we are to love one another. As, as God has shown us how to love. And the, the greatest assurance that we know him is that we have love in our heart, that the Spirit of God is that which assures our heart before him that we know him because we're able to show that love 
We're able to be his conduit. So 1 Corinthians 13, the definitive work on love, and it says that love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It is not proud. It does not behave rudely or, or think low of other people to put them down. It does not seek its own. It's not selfish. It's not easily provoked. It does not think evil. It doesn't devise how to hurt somebody. It does not rejoice in iniquity. You don't laugh when somebody falls or gets hurt, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. If you love somebody, you'll put up with anything. Believes all things. In other words, you trust them even beyond uh, their ability to trust themselves. Hopes all things. It means you hope for the future. You don't say, ah, they've always been this way. They'll never change. Love does not do that. And love endures all things. And love never fails. This is a descriptive of unconditional love which God has for us. And if God has put this love in you and shown you this love, then you can carry this love to other people and you can give it away. So it's my prayer that God would help us to be instruments of his love, conduits of his perfect, unconditional, self-sacrificing love like Jesus had for us. Lord Jesus, I pray that you might instill these things in our heart and stir us up to love and good works. In Jesus' name, amen.